Hi, everyone. I'm here with Philip Peterson again. He's our chief investment strategist with IG. This is We do this every quarter. And Philip, I wanted to thank you again for taking your time, particularly at the end of a very spectacular quarter. Well, Rod, very happy to be here. Yes, you're right. It's been a great quarter, and I'm really happy to talk about it. Yeah, well, listen, um, I wanted to just sort of get to it right away. You know, what we always do is take this opportunity to get your feedback on the questions that we're getting from our clients. And I would be very remiss if I didn't go to the first hot button there is, uh, which is a, an election that is 34 days from today, 34 days only. So, you know, give us your take on what is it that you are doing as an investment strategist when it comes to things like these big elections, particularly in the U.S.? Great question. And, and it comes up every four years during a presidential election. Every time that uh, this pops up, we get the question, what are we doing in our portfolios to take advantage of it or to protect, depending on, on the policies that are said on the campaign trail? And there's been uh, not a lot of firm policy that's been presented by either candidate. So, you know, in this regard, you know, there is not a lot that or there's nothing that we would do in portfolios today as a result of the potential win by, say, Trump or Harris at this point in time, we often say, look, the election doesn't matter itself. It's the policy that follows. And so here we need to wait to see who controls the Senate or which party controls the Senate, which party controls Congress, who ends up in the White House, and then the actual policy that may or most likely may not follow. And so to make any kind of reaction uh, on something that is uncertain in the future into a portfolio today is to make a mistake. So it's a wait and see approach. And at this point, we think it's gonna end up in gridlock. We think it's gonna be a split Congress. And so not a lot is gonna get done and the markets tend to favor that. So status quo is for the, 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 the positioning for the time being. Yeah, isn't that interesting? You know, and as you were talking, I was actually thinking about back to the UK, when the UK was going through a vote to whether they stay within the EU or separate, right? Do you want to run us through exactly what happened through that scenario? Yeah, it's a great story, because I remember it distinctly leading into it, you know, we we're asked about, well, what happens if if the UK votes to leave? This was the Brexit vote. And you know, we have no good political insight on that. You know, that's not what we follow. And in fact, leading up to it, we said, well, they're probably not going to vote to leave. That's my gut instinct. But, you know, my gut is completely wrong when it comes to politics. What was really interesting is the day after the vote, you saw the FTSE 100, which is the benchmark for UK stocks, fall by 10 percent. And and we were on the phone to our our clients and and uh, advisors that we work with saying this is a great buying opportunity because nobody knows the outcome of this. But we what we know is that companies are driven by the profit motive. And if they can't maintain their profits by being based in the UK, they'll relocate to the continent. And what we saw is a complete rebound in the market inside of two weeks. And so that was a lesson that you know sometimes if, if a political event triggers volatility for the wrong reasons, you can capitalize on it. Yeah, interesting. I think we the we exact same scenario uh, about eight years ago uh, when the first election with you know Trump, of course, and Clinton, and uh, the bets were there was heavy bets one way or the other, and including on the market. But what I do remember is it, it was irrelevant the day that the, the election was over and Trump was declared the the leader and the winner as a president. The markets absolutely soared because all they needed was an answer. There was no policy exactly. at that point. They just needed an answer to know that it was over. Right? right, exactly. Once you remove the uncertainty, then you can get back to the focus on the fundamentals. And the fundamentals back in 2016, leading into 2017, were improving. Yeah, it's very interesting because there's very little volatility leading up to this election, in my opinion. Right? Yeah, uh, I would argue that a lot of people really don't care about it. I mean, it's interesting yeah, it's to just... watch, but from the market perspective, it doesn't matter because there aren't any great consequences that are likely to follow. Yeah, and and probably part of that too is uh, because it's the, you know it, one of them is a known entity. There's no surprise, exactly. right? Exactly. Um, so the other thing that comes up, and I think it really does tie in because it certainly is a, an election issue, but there there's a lot of turmoil in the Middle East, and it's it's not that that turmoil in the Middle East is new, it's the escalation that has everybody concerned. Tell me a little bit about, you know, what your opinion are and maybe how you're also helping position the portfolios. Yeah. And this is where it gets really interesting because, 
typically we say, look, there's always a conflict somewhere in the world. You can point to it, whether it's in the Middle East, whether it's in Eastern Europe, whether it's in Africa, there's always something going on. Whether it has a meaningful impact to the markets or not, that's where the real work starts. And so like what we saw when Russia invaded Ukraine, one of the consequences to what we're seeing in the Middle East potentially is a disruption in oil supply. Um, it's been a year now. You know, when when Hamas bombed Israel, that happened October 7th. It was almost exactly a year ago today. Uh, and as you point out, Rod, uh, we've seen just an escalation of the conflict where Israel now is, is moving into Lebanon and, and Iran just sent a barrage of missiles over into Israel. Um, it seems that th we're going to continue to see some escalation. From the market perspective, you know, it comes back to, okay, well, this doesn't change how we view Bell Canada, Loblaws, but it can change how we view oil. Because if we do see a meaningful disruption of oil production out of Iran, Iran uh, produces about 1.5 million barrels a day. It's approximately 2% of global supply. Um, and they're, they're in full production mode right now. So if that gets disrupted in, in some way, that can change the dynamic of global supply and demand push oil prices higher. Okay, so what does that mean? Do I just go out and buy oil? Well, one of the safer ways that we can take advantage of, of any um, gains in the price of oil is in Canada. We have phenomenal oil producers here. Oil is a global market. It doesn't matter whether you're producing in the Middle East, um, in, in Africa, or in Canada, the price is effectively the price. I mean, there are some nuances to it, but if we see supply tighten up, price moves up across the board. That is potentially a positive catalyst for the TSX. We haven't really seen the price of oil move up much. It's actually quite low at $70 a barrel today. Um, yeah. And we would say there's no political risk or geopolitical risk priced into oil today. That can change very, very quickly. We could see oil get to $80, $85 or even higher. And given how low or how cheap oil stocks are today, you know, it's, it's an attractive uh, hedge against some risk that's happening elsewhere in the world. Well, so, you know, yeah, thank you. And that, cause that great tie-in by the way, because I know one of the, one of the questions we get a lot, by the way, this time of year is what's going to happen to the Canadian dollar. Now there's been a bit of disconnect with the dollar of late. So well, I'm going to throw you a, I'm going to throw you a curveball with that one. Yeah. And, and here's where we've been surprised. Our view up to now has been a weaker Canadian dollar. Um, and that's predicated on the fact that the Bank of Canada is likely going to have to cut interest rates here faster than what we see in the United States. That's not what is being priced into the market, though. Right now, what's being priced in the market is the Bank of Canada from where we are today and the Federal Reserve will cut in lockstep with each other. And the Canadian dollar at that assumption fair value is around 74 cents. Now we continue to think that, you know, the Bank of Canada will have to cut faster than the Fed. Our economy is a little bit weaker, unemployment's a little bit higher. But then you have this wild card that if oil jumps, that's the other condition that drives the Canadian dollar. And so that could offset and we could actually see potentially a stronger dollar from here. So yeah, I, I would say I'm less confident on my call on the Canadian dollar over the course of the next six months. 74 cents, it could be plus or minus, let's say 2% in either direction, depending on what happens to oil or what the Bank of Canada does. And I'm not confident in either position right now. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, well, it's hard when it's hard when we're not in control of the price of oil or the interest rates, but it makes yeah, it- Exactly. Yeah. yeah, we just have to sit there and, and, and kind of plan for the highest probability outcome and then be surprised. Well, so I'm going to change tactics just a little bit, Philip, because, uh, you know, again, our clients are, you know, they're thinking about their portfolios, right? What are the outcomes? How are we positioning? So, you know, we've gone through uh, an economic event that is unprecedented, which was the pandemic. You know, the, the steepest recession in recorded history, one of the fastest recoveries ever, um, you know, rapid escalation of inflation, followed by a rapid escalation of interest rates at a pace rarely seen before in history. And here we sit four years later, uh, we're talking about inflation. We're not even really talking about inflation anymore. It's really not even a headline. And we are talking about interest rate reduction. So I'm going to let you run with that about what is that, what is the environment today? And what is it, what does it mean for our investors really going forward at this time? Yeah, I would say, you know, where we've come through that journey uh, going back to 2020 is to a normal environment 
from an inflation perspective again. Now that doesn't remove the inflation that we've seen. That it's not going to take prices back to where they were in 2019. But from here, we see inflation trending at a normal pace of between two and three percent. And that is again what we should expect. If you go back over the last say 50 to 70 years, what's been the average inflation rate in Canada? Closer to three percent, not the two target that the Bank of Canada has or that the Federal Reserve has. That's kind of you know um and nice to, but it's not a necessary um, achievable target, especially when you look longer term. So in Canada, we're back uh, below 3%. In fact, actually, if you take shelter costs out of the equation, inflation over the last year um, was up half a percent. So barely there at all. It's really what's driving inflation has been, ironically, the interest rates, because that feeds into higher mortgage rates and higher rents. Um, but as interest rates come down, as you're right, you know, the Bank of Canada doesn't need to keep rates where they are. They can continue to cut. And we think they will through this year and into next year. We'll get back to a normal interest rate environment where the overnight rate in Canada is probably going to be closer to 3%. Inflation is going to be running you know, between 2 and 3 um, And that's where we should be. So investors can actually, you know, I, I would say, breathe a sigh of relief that the inflation fears of a couple of years ago aren't going to materialize. The interest rate fears of, are we going back to the early 80s? Well, no, that's not the case. We know the path for interest rates is lower. And from a portfolio perspective, we've enjoyed great returns out of bonds over the last year. And where yields are and the prevailing interest rate environment tells us that returns out of bonds are going to be actually quite decent over the coming years ahead of us. Yeah, isn't that interesting? It wasn't too long ago. I remember, I think it was during the pandemic where there was a lot of articles around what we called the, they called it the death of the balanced investor, right? Because bond yields, you know, were so muted that the future was awful. There was no way, you know, the, the, anyway, but here we are talking two years later, really, uh, about bonds being an integral part of a portfolio, not just for stability, but also great growth potential. And I, I agree with you. Yeah, As absolutely. Should, by and, the way. Yeah. Well, you know, we've heard this um, numerous times over the last 30 years, the death of the 60-40 portfolio, the death of diversification. Um, and, and that's not, you know, the, the right way to look at it, right? Um, you know, diversification is a moving target, right? Asset allocation is a moving target. It's never 60-40, you know, 60% equities, 40% bonds and call it a day and, and your job is done. You move with the environment. Now, where we are today is the environment is such that bonds are paying us a mid single digit return over the last year. Bonds are up upper single digit uh, returns, um, which is quite attractive. And right. as we look forward, you know, you can you can easily calculate, you know, what is the expected return out of bonds going forward? It's usually the current yield today. And in a blended portfolio, we're looking at about five percent. That is a historical normal return for bonds. And that's where we are. Yeah, interesting. So in this in this environment, economically speaking, um, you know, interest rates are coming down many times. That will be because, uh, you know, there's a severe recession coming or some, you know, very deep recessionary fears. This is a little bit of a different circumstance and it creates a lot of positivity also for markets. And I think confidence looking in the future. So I'm going to let you again run with that and maybe tell me a little bit more based around where we're positioning the portfolios today as well to capture Exactly. So uh, you're you're right. Where normally when you get the Bank of Canada cutting interest rates, it's in reaction to a much weaker economy. You know, we're headed towards a recession or what we saw in 2015, the Bank of Canada cut its overnight rate by 50 basis points. This is when oil was collapsing for an emergency cut to or an insurance cut to just help support the Canadian economy. Um, today, that's not the case. Today, it's, hey, you know, we've won the battle against inflation. We don't need the overnight rate to be at 5%. We're reducing it now. We've cut it three times. We're going to continue to cut twice more before the end of the year and, and then continue on next year. Um, and it's not in reaction to some dire economic conditions ahead of us. It's in reaction to what we've succeeded with behind us, which is taming inflation. So that's the good thing. And when you see that historically, when you when the Bank of Canada or the Federal Reserve is cutting interest rates, not because of recessionary conditions, but because of a normalization, this tends to be good. It tends to be good for bonds. And it's also, it can be good for 
um, equities because it reduces your cost of capital. Like companies can borrow now at a cheaper rate. It makes valuation look a little bit better. It makes the earnings that companies generate more attractive in a lower interest rate environment. So this is perhaps why when the Federal Reserve in the United States cut by 50 basis points in September, the market rallied on that because this is actually good news as opposed to the cutting because of bad news. Yeah, interesting. And so what is what is the positioning that you're doing today within, uh, within the iProfile program which you manage? Right. So interestingly, we are actually overweight bonds and underweight equities. Now, the reason being is because when we look at the returns on bonds versus the returns on equities over the course of the next 12 months, we see them being around the same in the you know, positive uh, mid single digit range. But the everything that we do um, considers the upside risk as well as the downside risk. Now, the upside risk, I would argue, is a little bit more limited. So stocks are fully valued. Right? So you're not going to see the price move up without earnings following. Now, earnings... Sorry, sorry, Philip, when you're talking about fully valued, are you talking worldwide or are you talking particular markets? Uh, you know, there, there are very few cheap markets out there. Um, but the U.S. You know, is, is fully valued, meaning when we look at valuation, um, it, you never know that, okay, that's where it should be. It's more like a pendulum and it swings, you know, and, and you can recognize when the markets are undervalued and you can recognize when the markets are really expensive you know and that would be say march of 2020 sorry uh march of, of 2000 we got to go back you know almost 25 years <laughs> for that yeah. um but uh, you know we, the pendulum has swung so that you know markets are are richly valued they're not you know, expensive but they're not cheap and that's the case in the u.s case in canada case in, in uh, uh, international equity markets as well. Perhaps the emerging markets are one of the exceptions that are much cheaper. Um, and so with that in mind, what we need to see to have confidence that the markets can outperform over the course of the next year is superior earnings growth, You know, meaning companies need to generate greater profits in the next year than what we've seen. The economic data doesn't scream you know, outsized growth. So we're gonna be a little bit more conservative and, and trim some of the profits that we've enjoyed over the last two years and shift that to bonds that we believe will deliver a similar return with virtually no downside over the course of the next 12 months. And we, we evaluate this as we go forward. Yeah. Um, so that we, we are slightly, you know, say overweight fixed income or bonds, underweight equities, but within equities, we're overweight the emerging markets. So I mentioned the emerging markets are one of the cheaper areas around the world. We do see greater potential for, for profit growth out of the emerging markets. And then what we saw in the last couple of weeks was a massive stimulus plan announced by uh, the Chinese authorities that is, is working to prop up its stock market. So its stock market is up, I think, 20% in the last two weeks, prop up its, its property market, prop up its economy. And this is the second largest economy in the world. So this actually is a positive, not only for the Chinese equity market, but you know peripheral equity markets yeah. as well. Sure. Emerging markets. So that overweight to the emerging markets actually is working in our favor, has been over the past you know, couple months. Um, but in particular, with this surprise stimulus out of China, it's a nice catalyst to see the emerging mm -hmm. markets rally even stronger. Well, I, I tell you, it's the it's it is the beauty of our clients to have access to a discretionary portfolio. Right. It really is because you and I, you know, listening to you today, I don't know anybody that doesn't want to know that they have a portfolio that is dynamic in nature, right? Like, like it is where it's moving around the world, but also the ability to flex between equities and fixed income. So today we're running portfolios that have less risk with the same or better upside. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's exactly what one, we're trying to do. Yeah. I don't know one client that doesn't want that. Right. right. Yeah. It's always the, the focus on, you know, we can't just look only at the upside, we have to recognize what the potential downside risks are, mitigate for that, while still trying to maximize our returns uh, as we look forward over the next year to two years. Yeah. And, you know, what I'd like to do, Philip, is, uh, you know, the next time really dig into maybe a little bit more about the private credit side that we're using, right? Because I know that's an ever increasing space within the portfolios, um, you know, to help provide stability, right? Consistency of returns without worrying about the economic duress that may be happening plus or minus at any time, right? Yeah, absolutely. Happy to dive into that. And we can talk about private equity as well and some of the other interesting things that we're doing within the portfolios. Oh, that was almost like a commercial thing. That was almost like a teaser on BNN going to the commercial, wasn't it? Hey, eh? Sounds a lot like it. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, well, Philip, again, I don't want to keep you too long. I really appreciate the time. I know you're very busy. I know you're traveling around all the time. Uh, I really appreciate your insights and that you would do this for us and our clients. Um, is there any party comments that you may have about what you're feeling really just over the next 12 months? Well, I'll say this, you know, given some of the, the data that's come out, um, I'm feeling a little bit more confident uh, over the course of the next 12 months. I think some of the, the fears of, of a rapid decline in economic output um, are abating. Um, and while that doesn't necessarily translate into you know, equity returns that we've enjoyed over the last year or two years, I think we're, we're going to be close to average, which is still decent. And you know, even if the markets are up one or two percent, you're still in a bull market. So, yeah, you know, I think there are more reasons to be optimistic about uh, 2025 as opposed to being concerned, and and that uh, uh, that's a nice change over the last couple of months. That is an excellent way to finish. Thank you, Philip. Right? Great pleasure. Every Thank you. Yeah, we'll talk to you again soon. Take care.